we're in a series called You People, and I want to talk about hypocritical people. Um, I want to ask you a question. Do you know any hypocrites in your life? <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun today. Because the way y'all, it was just the way y'all said it. Just the way y'all said, yes, <laughs> I know a few of them. <laughs> uh, maybe you know them from work, the grocery store. Um, maybe you know them at the park, wherever you go. Maybe the gym or, or maybe the mirror. Um, if you're sitting next to a hypocrite, what I want you to do is breathe. <laughs> Somebody said, <laughs> don't give birth today. <laughs> Push. <laughs> Listen, uh, but what I want to do is I want to kind of clarify what we mean or what we should mean when we say hypocrite. Because I think that we define terms very loosely. There's something called Christianese. Anybody know about Christianese? Christianese are these like Christian words that we throw around and we know what they mean, but many people don't know what they mean. And so we use this sort of like spiritual language and uh, Christian jargon to um, mask <laughs> things that we're saying. And I think when we say hypocrite, um, there's a different understanding that we have, and I want to try to hone down in on and pinpoint an actual definition of what that is from the Bible, and then talk about how then do we deal with people who we believe to be hypocritical. Is that, is that okay? All right, so, so I want to empower us today. We're going to be, if you're a Bible scholar and you are here and you got your Bible tightly, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. You can put a finger there. Um, if you're too cool for school and you're, um, you've got your smartphone, we'll, we'll have slides on the screen as well. Um, but I want you to put a, a, a pin there. We'll get to Galatians chapter 2. But I want to talk about that word hypocrite um, because that word hypocrite means something different for, for many different people. But when we see this word in Scripture, it has a, actually a very targeted definition. And so what we define as hypocrisy is we think that a hypocrite is um, a Christian who sins, you see a Christian who's doing something that they shouldn't be doing, and you go, oh, let's see, look at them hypocrites. And so we define hypocrisy very, very loosely. It is any Christian who does something that I don't think Christians should be doing. That's how we define hypocrisy. And, 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 and what I want to do is I want to make sure that we aren't so frivolous with throwing these words around like hypocrisy because they have a very specific definition. And in and, 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 uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus uses this word hypocrite for the first time, and he says this. It says, when you pray, don't be like the what? Say it loud. When you pray, don't be like the what? Who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where, every, and where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the, the reward they will get. What I want you to notice is that when Jesus calls people a hypocrite, it is not because he sees them sinning. When Jesus calls someone a hypocrite, he actually sees them praying. He actually sees them doing something spiritual, something godly. They're praying. And he goes, I want you to be like the hypocrites. What we tend to do is we see a Christian doing something that we disagree with. And we go, hypocrite. Gotcha. And that's not what a hip hypocrite is. A hypocrite is not merely someone who sins. I want you to write down this definition. A hypocritical Christian is one whose actions contradict their beliefs or their underlining motivations. It is a Christian whose actions contradict their beliefs or underlining motivations. So let me say in, in this way. Because I'm a Christian, here's what I know. I'm a sinner, and I need the grace of God. So when you see me sinning, does that mean that I'm a hypocrite? <laughs> because you see me doing the thing that I've already said that I am. 
Now, we, we can talk about when you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint, you're saved by grace, and that's a different conversation. I want to unpack that, but what I want to do is I want to make sure that we don't use loosely terms that were specific. You here today? So let's talk about it. Jesus uses this word hypocrite, and it wasn't a spiritual term. In the Greek culture, this word hypocrite, it was hypocritos, and it really meant stage performer or actor. So what he's saying is, I don't want you to be like those stage performers. These were people who were only spiritual when other people could see them. These were people who loved to pray, but they stopped praying when nobody was looking. It was like they only wanted to pray when they knew that somebody else could hear them. And there are people who are like that. There are people who don't have a prayer life at all until someone hears them. Father God, and somebody walks in the room, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you come, Lord. And the more people who are there, the, the more elaborate they get with their prayers. And Jesus says, those are stage performers. And he says they, they have their reward. What he means is what they were looking for was an audience, and they got it. And that's as far as the prayer goes. And so there are people whose spirituality is nothing more than a performance. And so a hypocrite was not the spiritual word. It Literally, in our day, we would call Denzel a hypocritos. Julia Roberts a, a hypocritos. Like, these were, these were actors, and he's saying, I don't want you to be like the actors who are only spiritual in certain environments and, and they don't reflect that spirituality in other environments. And, and this is why I wanted to still have this conversation because what I, what the challenge that we have in Christianity is we tend to express a level of uh, spirituality in these four walls that is different than the way we are outside of these four walls. I overheard a conversation, and, and somebody had said something in church, and they were like, oh, you can't say that in church. Wait till we get outside. And you, you know those kind of people, right? It, it's like, don't say that in here. Wait till we get. So the, I can tell when you're on the way to church by the music you pull up in. I can tell when church is over, when you get the Cali Steel Road at the light, <laughs> and then the regular week music comes out, the sunny day music comes out. And what God is saying, what God wants us to understand as Christians is it's exhausting being three and four and five different people in three and four and five different environments. And in fact, what God is trying to do is he's trying to save the real you, not the Christian version of you. And so you show up to church on Sunday with your Sunday's best, looking real good, nothing wrong with that. And, and, and you have your Christian attitude on. You, you, you're ready to greet people and say hello and hug and do all of that. But outside of these four walls, that's just not how you are. And, and Pastor Jenny and I, we made a decision um, just early on that we, we were just going to be who we are in every environment that we were in. And there are a lot of people who can't handle the humanity of a pastor, but we just made a decision that if we couldn't be human, then we just weren't going to do this. And, 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 and what I want people to understand is I wanted to deliver you from the mindset that says... That who you are in here has to be some, some changed version of who you are. But who you are out there is a person who God ain't done with me yet. <laughs> you know? And, and, and what I want to do is I want us to get in alignment with the different versions of ourselves. Wouldn't it be refreshing to be able to show up to every environment just as the authentic you? Take it or leave it. Now, everybody doesn't have to like it. But at least you know within yourself that you are being authentically you. 
and I want to talk about the three ways that we tend to deal with hypocritical Christians. Um, we do it in three ways. The first way is we confront them. There are certain people who love to confront hypocritical Christians. You're the ones with the, um, the Bible guns. <laughs> you, you got your little uh, scripture guns, pow, 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 pow. You see people who are not doing the things that you think that they should not be doing as Christians, and you are ready to, th to, to throw out them verses, those Bible verses, out of context, might I add, but you're ready. You're not supposed to be doing that, pow, pow, pow. And we love to, to confront people. There are social media pages and, and there are YouTube bloggers and there are all kinds of people who dedicate their lives to confronting what they believe to be hypocrisy in the body of Christ. I'm not saying that we shouldn't confront hypocrisy in the body of Christ, but there's a way that we should do it. There's a way that we should do it. There's actually a biblical way that we should do it. For other people, you don't confront what you do is this. You cancel. <laughs> Where are my cancel folk at? <laughs> you didn't unfollowed so many people that you used to follow. You've canceled people in your minds that don't even know you because of the hypocrisy. They just switching up too much. I don't know what they was doing. They just can't make up their minds, so I just got to unfollow. You cancel them. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't remove yourself from people who demonstrate hypocritical behaviors, but there's a way that we should go about this. And then the third category of people are people who just ignore. Where am I ignore folk at? If it ain't got nothing to do with me, it ain't got nothing to do with me. I mind my own business. <laughs> they said, I mind my own business. And there are times where you should mind your own business. But the problem is we cancel when we should confront. We ignore when we should cancel. We cancel when we should ignore. Like we don't know when to do what, how to do it in, in the way that God has actually required us to live this out in, in dealing with hypocritical Christians. So now we get to Galatians chapter 2. Let's go to it. Galatians chapter 2 starting in verse 11. <laughs> It's this story where the Apostle Paul is confronting Peter. The Apostle Peter is confronting him about some things that, that he needs to call out. And it says this. It says, but when Peter came to Antioch, he said, I had to oppose him to his what? To his face. For what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he was eaten with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But then afterward, once some friends of James came, Peter was switching up. He wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore because he was what? He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. Let's keep reading. It says, as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And so when I saw this, now I want to pause right here. If you have a Bible and you have your handy-dandy highlighter, this would be a great uh, verse and, and sentence to highlight or underline. If you've got a phone, just click the little highlight button. Um, if you're taking photos, I don't know. <laughs> but I think if you hit edit, you can do some fancy stuff in there, right? Right? Uh, Troy, he, he'll, he'll show you after church if, if you need some help. All right, so it says, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow, follow the Jewish traditions? So let me give you context of what's happening right now. When the initial message of the gospel was being preached, what was happening was it was being preached to a primarily Jewish audience. And so the early converts of Christianity were primarily people of a Jewish tradition. And that was just because of proximity and because they were close to these individuals and the gospel began to spread. 
And so what happened was Jewish followers were, were now putting their faith in Jesus. And then what they were doing is they were time, trying to kind of commingle Jewish customs with faith in Jesus. And essentially saying that, yes, faith in Jesus is, is cool, but you also need to be circumcised. And, and, if, and then you also need to be doing, eating these specific meals and, and doing these specific things. But God, his intention for the gospel and Jesus, when he empowered the apostles, what he said is, I want you to go, therefore, teaching all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Peter um, has a vision. God appears to Peter, and God tells Peter, hey, 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 I, I know that you once were excluding Gentiles, but I, I want you to preach the gospel to Gentiles. I want you to preach the gospel to everybody. I want you to, to let the world know that there is hope found in Jesus. And so the gospel was a message that was supposed to bring everybody into a saving knowledge of faith in Jesus. And Peter has this revelation that he has been essentially discriminating against a certain people group, particularly the Gentiles. And so he has this revelation from God, and then he goes and he's like, okay, I'm going to start eating with Gentile believers. I'm going to start like, living and doing life with Gentile believers to let them know that there is hope in Jesus beyond just Jewish um, people and, and, and ideology. And so he goes and he opens up his arms to people that are not just Jew. But then he's here in Antioch, and some people come. James's friends come, and they start seeing him eating with Gentile believers and hanging with Gentile believers. And so Peter starts switching up because he didn't want them to say anything. Oh, they're going to see me hanging with these people. And so Paul, he feels called to the Gentile people. He, he feels called to preach the message to Gentile believers, and he sees Peter trying to act like he doesn't want to associate with Gentiles, and it's giving Gentiles the, the wrong idea of the gospel. He's, it's communicating to the Gentiles that they're not welcome in the community of faith. And Paul's like, I can't, I can't let that happen. So Paul walks up to Peter, and he's like, hey, bro, why are you trying to switch it up? You was just eating with the Gentiles. Now, James's folks is here, and you're trying to act like you don't want anything to do with them. And so Paul is confronting Peter. But what I want you to understand is that Paul had a revelation of the gospel message. And the reason that he was wanting to confront Peter is because Peter's actions were giving the wrong idea, communicating the wrong idea about the truth of the gospel, so much so that there were other believers who started to follow his hypocrisy. And so Paul was like, I can't let that happen. So I want to give you a couple questions that I want you to ask before you go to confront that hypocrite in your life or on social media. Ask, are their actions inconsistent with the truth of the gospel or just my personal convictions? I want you to hear me today. You know I love you, right? I hope you know. Y'all love me? <laughs> Don't answer that. That, that. that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Listen, I, 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 want, I want you to get to a point in your relationship with God where you stop asking is this a sin or is that a sin? What's a sin? What's a sin? What's, I, I want you to stop asking that question. Here's a better question. Is this wise? The wisdom of God is what you need in your life. You don't need another a, a list of do's and don'ts. What you need is the wisdom of God. Is this wise? Now let me back into this because I got a lot of amens. Okay, stay with me. You may not amen. But there are some things that God will give you wisdom about for your personal life, and he will tell you no. But he didn't tell everybody no. 
And wisdom and humility says, I'm okay with God's no for me. It's a no for me, dog. You remember Randy? <laughs> American Idol? Yeah. It, it's, it's a no for me. But you have at it. You, you do what you got to do. But what I want you to stop doing is I want you to stop projecting your personal convictions and making them universal commands. There are some things that are not universally commanded by God for all people. But if you were to do that thing, it would be a sin for you. And I want you to be okay with that reality. And I take it a step further. You, you, didn't, you didn't went to the store. And you saw this Christian who was at the store. And oh my goodness, they had beer in their, their cart. They had a bottle of wine. What in the heavens? You saw a car pulling out of the liquor store that you saw on church on Sunday, and you said, what in the world is these Christians out here doing? Should everybody drink? Nope. Are there people who should completely abstain forever? Yes. And it is not up for us to tell who those individuals are. There are individuals that I am telling you right now, you need to abstain from every form of alcoholic beverage. And you've given yourself a pass, but I'm here to tell you that it's not wise for you. But I'm also here to tell you that in the scriptures, there is no prohibition against consuming alcohol or wine here or there. Like, there's, there's tons of scriptures where they were, they were doing this, but it was not to a sense of drunkenness that would lead to debauchery. But what I want you to do is I want you to be honest because some people are consuming and they're going, hey, I'm not drunk yet. You know how you slurred that, that yet? <laughs> that that means that you you you're beyond the point. <laughs> I'm not drunk yet. <laughs> and 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 what you need is wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. You're looking for a line. You're looking for a, a rule book. But you need wisdom. You're, you're asking, well, is it okay to do this or do that? I want you to be honest with yourself. Why are you doing it? What reason? I had a tough week. I just need to forget about my problems. Well, God has given us something, someone to help us deal with a tough week who we can give our problems to. As Jesus says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Now this is, don't hear me, I'm not being, I'm not here to be legalistic. I'm not here to do that at all. But I do think that there is a certain level of wisdom that we should maintain. But also, let's just say, that God has given you, that like you can enjoy a glass of wine or whatever. You don't, you don't feel that conviction in your heart. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I'm, I'm not here to, to tell you one way or another. But I want you to use your freedom responsibly as well. Oh, well, God, it ain't a sin, so I'm just going to do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it. It's just going to be what it's going to be, you know what I'm saying? No. No, no, you have a responsibility. With every freedom, there comes responsibility. And there are some people who are weak in the faith and they can't handle that reality. Now, I want you to hold this intention because you remember what I said before? How you got to be authentic in every... So isn't there a tension here? Because it's like, well, how can I be authentic but also, like... I got to switch up when these people come around. 
If I'm in a place of freedom and I understand that I have a responsibility even in my place of freedom, there are times where God may send you on a fast to abstain from whatever, however, and for however long. And if you can't do that, you got to understand that you might have a God or an idol, not just a freedom. And I want you to be aware of that. It shouldn't feel like you're switching up to say, I know I have a freedom to do a certain thing, but I'm, I want to honor this person who has a sensitivity. Y'all here today? But enjoy what God has given you to enjoy, and don't project your personal convictions onto others. I'll tell you a story. Um, uh, Jenny, Pastor Jenny, she, she, um, she, ha- she told me this story one time about her grandma. And her grandmother um, called her a hypocrite one time. And it was when she was in college, she had did some, she did the unthinkable. And she went and she got her belly button pierced, y'all. What in the heathen? <laughs> Pastor Jenny. <laughs> That's why she was up here pouring out to God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so, so she went and got her belly button pierced. And at first she's like hiding it, you know, from her grandma. She's got a traditional Haitian family and her grandmother, she knew what it was going to be, but she's, she's hiding it, you know. But it got to a point to where she was just like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in college. Like, I can't just be walking around here hiding stuff all the time. So she exposed it. And her grandmother saw it and was like, you hypocrite, until you do right by me. Everything you think about is going to fail. And so she's calling her a hypocrite. She's going off. She's, she's confronting her about her hypocritical behavior. And Jenny's like, what? And um, Jenny gets sick one, one week, and she, she stays home from, from school. And she's laying in the bed, and she's sick, and her grandmother comes by and says, it's because you got that belly button pierced. And until you get right with God, you're going to be sick. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> right. I wanted to confront her about her hypocrisy. But what was really going on? Well, she probably had a sensitivity about piercing her, your body. And, and, and her as a Christian probably was convicted about that, that Christians shouldn't pierce their body. But what she did was she made it universal rather than personal. And this is what we tend to do in the body of Christ. We tend to make things that are not universal, like, like universal, and we make things that, that, that are supposed to be between me and God. God has this for me. And then this is my relationship with him. It's, it's not for everybody, and that's okay. But you got to be comfortable allowing people to do what they have the freedom to do and still be submitted to God and what you know he's asking you not to do. So she called out her hypocrisy. And um, the rest is history, you know. (laughs) Now let's get to the second question that we need to ask. We need to ask, do their actions negatively impact others? negatively impact others. The reason that Paul wanted to confront Peter was not just because it was inconsistent with the truth of the gospel, although that was one of the reasons. The other reason was other people were starting to follow in his actions. And it was starting to give people the impression that God did not want them to be included in the message of faith. And Paul said, I can't let that happen. This is starting to impact other people as well. And so you're asking these first two questions. Are their actions inconsistent with the truth of the gospel or my personal convictions? Or do their actions negatively impact others? Here's the third question that I want you to ask is, can I see the rationale behind their actions despite my reservations about those actions? And this is a, 
a question that's going to make you dig a little bit deeper. Because maybe you see a behavior or you see some kind of action that's inconsistent with the truth of the gospel. And, but can you see the rationale behind it? Like, can you see the logic behind it? Have you ever had a broken heart and has that ever sent you into a spiral where you wanted to just black out and be numb? And so you see a Christian who's just trying to black out and be numb all the time, and you want to you wanna call out their hypocrisy. But I want to ask you, can you at least see the rationale behind it? Like they're dealing with a broken heart. They're not just doing this thing just to do it. Like there's something, there's a, there's a logic behind it, even if they're unaware. What we tend to do is we tend to embrace God's mercy and God's grace for our own lives because what we think is our sin is accidental. And we have a hard time extending grace because we think everybody else's sin is intentional. I want you to go back to Galatians chapter 2 and 12. It says, when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers. This is Peter. When he first got there, he was welcoming those people who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. It says he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. It says that Peter was afraid. A lot of times, hypocrisy has a root of fear. People become afraid of demonstrating their faith in an authentic way because of what people might say about them. And so you might have someone who's in college and they're out getting drunk all the time, but this is the only community that is accepting them. And they desire people, acceptance and relationship. So they compromise, they do things they shouldn't do because they're looking for acceptance and they're afraid of being isolated or rejected. So what I want us to do is when we look at hypocritical Christians, I want us to stop looking at them as just like hypocritical Christians because what we're doing is we're demonizing them and we need to humanize every human being. <laughs> Romans tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul had power to confront because he said this in Romans 7.15 about his own self. He says, I don't really understand myself. Anybody here today? I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Have you confronted your own hypocrisy? It is not that we shouldn't judge people. It is that the same measure that you judge will be judged. <laughs> You'll be judged in that same measure. So the scripture tells us to make a sober judgment, to make a, a honest assessment of the situation, to take the log out of our own eyes before we look at the speck in someone else's eye. And then when it gets to a point to where you feel like, yeah, well, I, I think I need to confront this person. Let me give you those three ways that we should do it. I want everyone to repeat after me. Look up at me and everyone say this. Here's the first thing. Everyone say gently, humbly. Here's the last one. Help. Everyone say gently, humbly, help. If you can't do any one of these things, or all, you need to do all three, and if you fail at doing any one of them, it's not your ministry to confront them. Gently, humbly, help. Look at what it says in Galatians 6. And here's the thing. There are platforms dedicated to this, y'all. There are people who are convinced that I've got to call out every hypocrite in the world and just tell them what needs to be said. They did it publicly, so I need to do it publicly. And, and the scripture says this. The scripture says this in Galatians 6.1. 
This is Paul speaking. This is the same guy who called out Peter for his hypocrisy. He says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. He says, if you're godly, you need to be gentle and humble. And you have to have the intention to help them back on the right path. And so then you might say to yourself, well, I don't have access to them. I got good news. Then it ain't your ministry. <laughs> so, 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 so then you say, well, they did it publicly. So I need to post about it publicly and, and, and call them out publicly. Because I don't know them. And what I love is that Galatians is a letter to all the churches in Galatia. Isn't it interesting that Paul didn't wait for the letter to all of the churches in Galatia to address Peter's hypocrisy? Isn't it interesting that we don't see a chapter in Galatia dedicated to confronting Peter for all of the churches in Galatia to see just because it was a public demonstration? What he said is, I opposed him to his face. You say, I don't have access to his face. Then it ain't your ministry. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Like literally, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, we have been committed to and given the ministry of reconciliation, saying this, be reconciled to God. And you say, well, I don't, I don't know them. Well, you, if you don't know them and you don't love them, you can't correct them. Relationship precedes correction. And I want us to I want us to be people who honor God, who live lives that are authentic. I'm not asking, it's, it's not about perfection. But when we put our faith in Jesus, we understand we're on a journey, on a process, and you may see some people who are doing some things that you disagree with, and that's okay. It's okay to disagree with the things that you see people doing. But if you want to move to confronting them, and, and, and if you think it's your responsibility to stand up for biblical truths, there's a way to do it. And Scripture says, if you're godly, you'll gently and humbly help them back on the right path. Let's pray.